Good morning, and welcome to worship this morning at First Presbyterian Church in Denison and Grand Avenue Presbyterian Church in Sherman. We're so glad to have you with us. I encourage you to participate in worship with us by supporting a congregation that you are a part of or by supporting this ministry. And we look forward to our time of worship together. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us worship God. join me in the call to worship. People of God, listen. The, the Lord, Lord has done marvelous things. Teach your children all that God has done, so, so that they may live in hope and die, and die in peace. peace. And gracious God, you are all light and wonder and glory. You are our strength and our delight. You give us all we need to live. Yet we are distracted by all that glitters, continually grasping for more. Rather than trust in your provision, we chase after our own happiness. Forgive us, Lord, and turn us back to you. Overwhelm us with your goodness and cover us with grace, for we know that you are the source of life, the font of all that is good. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Join me in saying, in his name we pray. Amen. Nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In, in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
lesson today is Joshua, the 24th chapter, verse 1 through 3, verses 14 through 25. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and mine, also we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did these great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land, Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is a holy God, but he is a jealous God. But Joshua said to the people, excuse me, but Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. I invite you to stand as you're able as we hear this word from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, um, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no. There will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. While they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
How do you prepare for something new? What do you do if you're about to launch into a new thing or begin something new? How do you prepare? What do you do? Research. Research. Yes, that's right. So some of the things that we might be preparing to do, we would want to know about. We'd want to know about what's ahead. If it's a new job, you would want to know about the things that are expected of you. If it's um, uh, a new setting that you're going to be in, you want to find out about what's available, uh, where you'll need to go. Uh, if there's a new era coming, you would want to know about what that new era might be. In some ways, as we look back on the election of this, this past week, some may be thinking, this is like a new era or a continuation of the old era. It might be that we want to know about what we would expect. And as we think about a new time, there are some who might be very happy, very pleased with this, the time that we're in. There are others who maybe are very disappointed. There are some who may have high expectations and some who may have high anxiety. But as we look ahead, we want to try to figure out what it is we're to be doing. What does all of this mean for us? Whether this is an election that has gone in your favor or one that you would think of as not so much in your favor. When we hear the passages for this morning, we hear the gospel reading where Jesus is speaking about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven will be like this. There are wedding attendants getting ready for the wedding, and they're going to welcome the bridegroom, he says. The attendants would have, uh, would have taken little lamps uh, maybe you've seen some of them. They, they are uh, little flat um, clay pots that are open on the top with, with a little kind of spout on the end where the wick would go. You would pour oil into this lamp and you would light it. And that would be what you would welcome the bridegroom with when he came after dark. But the bridegroom was late and coming. Uh, other things were happening. He wasn't there quite on time, and it was long enough that all of the bride, bridesmaids fell asleep. And then someone saw the bridegroom coming and woke everybody up. As the story goes, there are five bridesmaids or attendants who were ready and well prepared. They knew what to expect. They not only had their lamps full, but they had little extra containers that they'd brought to fill up their lamps. But there were five foolish attendants who hadn't brought quite enough. A lot of their oil had already burned up as they waited before they fell asleep. So when the bridegroom actually came, they didn't have enough oil. Their lamps were about to go out. Now the way the story goes, Jesus says, the ones who weren't prepared got kicked out. Does that sound like heaven? It doesn't quite sound like what we would expect heaven to be like. But as Jesus is talking about this, he's not talking about who might be let in and who might be kicked out, as much as he's talking about who might be prepared. What do you do to prepare? You try to anticipate the situation you look at what might be needed, you do your research, and you bring things together, you bring resources together, and then you may be prepared. Prepared for what? When Jesus speaks about the kingdom of heaven, he's speaking about the kingdom of heaven like a wedding banquet. He's spoken about it being like a wedding banquet several times before, a wedding banquet where we all come in and eat, where we all have this great celebration of good things that are happening. We're to be prepared. How is it that we're to bring the extra things that we need so that we're able to welcome 
the bridegroom, who is Jesus, to welcome the one who is coming again. Now, when Jesus told the story, of course, he was thinking about him coming again as the bridegroom, coming again as Emmanuel, the Son of God in the flesh, to be with us. But as he tells the story, he speaks about the bridegroom coming late, about it may be taking longer than what's expected. Maybe as he continued these conversations with his followers that last week of his life on earth, he was beginning to anticipate the ways in which maybe this will take a little longer. Maybe it won't happen right away, as he thought earlier. Maybe this is something that will take some time, and we have to be prepared for that time, to anticipate that time. When Jesus speaks about the kingdom of heaven, he's speaking not about being ready for some pie in the sky by and by. He's speaking about the ways in which we're to be prepared for heaven, not like it's some static place that we're going to go to one day, but an active verb that we're to be engaged in here and now, so that as we think about the kingdom of heaven, we think about preparing for the kingdom of heaven by what we do here and now, by the ways that we go about trying to proclaim justice, justice that is real for real people, that we go about exercising a sense of equality that really does welcome, a, welcome everyone of every persuasion, where we would go and light lamps that shine on righteousness, shine on the ways that people are doing the right things here and now so that people come to know what the kingdom of heaven is like when it comes close, when we know it with our neighbors, when we know it with our friends, when we know it with our family members, and when we know it with maybe some of those family members who are distant and cut off from us, how might we reconcile those relationships? When we know it with our enemies, how is it that we might bridge the gap between the people that we've been separated from, the people who have said maybe they hate us or that we feel sometimes as though we hate them? How is it that we're able to bridge the political divide that the church would call us to, to bridge, to go across, not in a kind of partisanship, but recognizing the ways in which the church is to be involved politically in reaching out to everyone, to being a part of the body politic in a way that brings an end to divisions, because we have this vision of the kingdom of heaven where the banquet is set for everyone. How is it that we go about lighting our lamps for the light to shine on those kinds of things so that we are able to come together as people of God? That would give us a glimpse of what heaven is supposed to be like. So we go and research, we prepare, we go and look for the ways that we can go be a part of those things of justice and righteousness, of loving kindness, of the values of the kingdom of heaven here and now. When we take a look at the passage from Joshua, it comes at an important time in the life of the people of God. They've crossed over the river. They've gone to the other side. They're preparing for a new thing. And they're a little uncertain about what to do. Joshua stands and speaks before them and asks them an important question. Are you going to serve the gods of your ancestors? The, the gods that maybe your ancestors knew before Moses, before Abraham? The gods of Egypt or the gods of the Amorites? Or will you serve the God who has brought us to this place? In the first 13 verses of this passage, 10 of which we skip, there are 18 references 
where God uses the first person singular pronoun, I. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I gave to you. I loved you. I did all of these things. I, God says, I. God is reminding us of all of the things that God has done for us to bring us along, to bring us into this promised land. God is reminding us of all of the history that we have shared with God. And then Joshua says, and this day you must choose. It's an act of covenant renewal, of renewing our relationship with God, of renewing where we are here and now, of renewing what it means to be the people of God. Choose this day whom you will serve, Joshua says. Will it be the old little gods of division? Will it be the old little gods that would have us go in different directions and, and serve in different ways, serve some idols that would tell us, no, no, these are the things that are important. Prosperity is important, or being in powerful positions are important. Is it that we would serve the small gods of our ancestors? Or we would serve the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Choose this day whom you would serve, Joshua says. No matter whether you agree or disagree or are excited or disappointed by the results of our election, where we happen to be now. We are called to be the church. We are called to serve the Lord. We are called to go and take a different message to all of the people. We are called to go and proclaim righteousness. We are called to go and live out justice. We are called to go and be symbols, a light to the world of God's loving kindness. When we go and do those things, it's possible then for us to bring many other people together to know what it means to serve the Lord. That's what God calls us to do. And we're called to be engaged and involved in the very politics of the world, just not the partisanship of the world, as we would go and point the way, shine the light, and say, this, this is whom we shall serve. I invite you to stand as you're able, as we say together what we believe. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the broken heart of heart, eating without cross, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal.
Friends, let us join together in a word of prayer for those persons in our concerns. Let us pray. God, we come to you in thanksgiving for the ways that you call us to be your faithful people, for the ways that you challenge us to come and serve you in a world that is sharply divided. We give thanks and sometimes somewhat reluctantly accept your challenge to respond to the divisions of the world by going and meeting those who might call us enemies or with whom we might feel division to be a part of healing them. We give thanks to you for the grace that you give to us and for the ways that you call us to be gracious people. We come before you remembering those whom we know to be in need. For Louise, and Jerry Sue, and Tom, who face the limitations that they know in assisted living, for the ways that they feel a sense of loneliness, we pray for ways that we may be a part of reaching out to them and have them know that they are not alone. For Sally, as she continues treatment for pancreatic cancer, for Tiffany and for Ellen, as they begin treatment for breast cancer, we pray for their strength and for their well-being we pray that your healing ways may be a part of the medical care that they receive as doctors and nurses seek to do their best for them. For Wendy, as she prepares for hip replacement surgery, we pray for renewed mobility for her. For Kathy, who continues to be unresponsive in the hospital, for several days and whose life may soon come to its completion. We give thanks for the ways in which you love her and continue to love her, for the ways in which we are reassured that in life and in death we belong to God. We pray for Ken as he continues to know the challenge of this virus pray for his strength, for his ability to endure, and for his recovery. We pray for Jack, who succumbed to this virus. We pray for his family. We pray that your blessings would be with them, would uphold them, and give them strength. We pray that they would be surrounded by those who love and care for them and would remind them of the ways that they are loved by you. For Pam, who lost her husband, Larry, to the virus. We pray for her even as she is in a place far from us. We pray that your blessings of assurance, love, and your, your presence would be with her encouraging her. For Landers Sr., as he continues in the hospital with not much improvement, we pray for the best outcome that is possible. May your blessings be with each of these people, with many more, as we know and trust that you are already caring for them present with them, and are loving them. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. And now let us give God the Lord's tithes and our offerings.
hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God God thanks and praise. Lord our God, we come to you in thanksgiving for all the ways that you give us these opportunities to offer ourselves and our gifts to you. Pray that you would take us and use us in proclaiming your good news in every part of your creation. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord, who taught us to say, Our Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Friends, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Maker, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. The Lord be with us. The Lord be with us.